I've always known that there were stories in my family that were not really talked about. And as a child, I picked up on those. I didn't understand what the silences were about, but I knew that they were there. And as I grew older, I had various kind of responses to that silence. One of them was anger when I was a teenager. And after my father died in 2015, I suddenly felt this need to work with those silences and to understand what they were about. One of the ways of dealing with loss and grief was to understand who I'd lost exactly and what were the circumstances that shaped his life. So once I started asking questions in the family and exploring those stories, one story after another came tumbling out. This is the first piece I made. It's a costume for my grandfather, Henk. Um, it actually consists of various elements. So there's a suit of armour and there's a, a sash and a helmet and various artefacts and objects that go with it. This was actually the first part of the costume that I made. And it's based on the loincloth that my grandfather had to wear during his time working on the Burma railway line as a prisoner of war. So having done research and having made the loincloth, I then decided that you know, my grandfather didn't have anything to protect himself. He was literally shoeless, clothless. He just had this to wear. So I wanted to make him a, uh, a coat of armour to protect himself with. So that was the starting point for this idea. The piece up here um, represents my grandfather's star sign. He was a Taurus. He always talked about this being the blackest period of his life. So I wanted to kind of give this idea of this is something that's charred and stained and leaves a mark. In fact, most of the felt has been charred. I took a blowtorch to it. I wanted to show you this as well. This is a talismanic necklace that I made that goes with the costume and it has some glass vials. Um, some of them contain burned rice. This one contains charred eggshells and that um, refers to a time when my grandfather was put in the death tent and whilst he was in a coma, a doctor who was a fellow um, prisoner of war, Dr. Kaupers, he managed to get hold of two eggs and he saved them, put them aside for my grandfather so that when he came out of his coma there were these two eggs waiting for him and he, he talked about those eggs um, quite a bit, especially later on in his life and to me they just represent a, a new start. One of the things I wanted to do is to give my grandfather protection, posthumous protection. So the idea of an armour arose and I, I actually did quite a bit of research into um, if there was any armour on Java at all, which is where he was from, um, and I couldn't find any evidence. So I actually started looking at Japanese um, samurai outfits because my grandfather has obviously been severely impacted by his time um, in a Japanese prisoner of war camp. And all throughout his life, he actually rejected Japanese cars, Japanese radios, Japanese TVs, etc., etc. So even though he rejected it, it was very much part of his daily experience in life. So I've hung it with charcoal. I've made them by hand, out of pine and out of oak. And I chose it because some of the stories that my grandfather told me about his survival was related to charcoal. One of the occasions was suffering from dysentery. He heard the voice of his mother say to him, eat charcoal. So he managed to get his hands on some charcoal from the fire and that stopped him from dehydrating and helped save his life. This piece here embedded in the chest is a, a ship's compass holder. It contains grains of rice that I've charred at the same time as making the charcoal when he was severely ill in his prisoner of war camp where he spent three and a half years. He was given scraps of burnt rice and again it's something that helped him turn a very difficult corner and it helped him to, to survive. So that was very important for me to include and it's sitting kind of in a place where his heart is and it's in a ship's compass holder which represents both his professional career as a marine and also his journey to the Netherlands.
So this ancestral healing costume is for my great-grandmother. Her name was Tumpek and she was also known as Sadira. And she was my grandfather's mother and in the gallery she faces him directly. My great-grandmother, I don't actually know an awful lot about her other than her name. She was what was known as a nyai, our word for that is a concubine. All I know is that she was indigenous, she was Javanese. And at some point in her life, she was probably quite young, she ended up in the household of my great-grandfather, who was Dutch, or possibly Dutch-Indonesian, I'm not entirely sure. And she became his housekeeper. That also meant she ended up sharing his bed. Whether that was voluntary or not, I don't know. It was a very much embedded part of colonial life, because there was a shortage of women in colonial Dutch Indies. Native women would end up being almost kept by European men. The word nyai, when you translate it, it actually translates as primal mother. And so for me, that was a really strong concept I wanted to work with for various reasons. Uh, one of the reasons was that I suspect, I'm not sure, but I suspect that after she had given birth to my grandfather and his sister, she was around for some time because my grandfather remembers her and has memories of her, but I suspect she was then sent away uh, when my great-grandfather married. He was already a widow with seven children, then Tumpa came in his life, gave him two children, and then he remarried. So I've actually made this hard. So both this, which is almost like a corset, and the headpiece are both rock hard. You wouldn't know it if you looked at it, but I know it. <laughs> and that says quite a lot to me. So I want to show you this. This is um, a Vayan Golek doll that my grandparents gave to me when I was young. And I've carried it with me all my life. And there's something about this tall silhouette that's always stayed with me. And a lot of my work, in fact, I've now realized um, kind of references this kind of tall, narrow silhouette. And I definitely wanted to incorporate that in this particular piece. The word vayang comes from a word that means shadow, and the root of that word comes from the word for ancestor. So to me, that just kind of was all the little dots connecting up, and it was important for me to include that as part of the representation of my great-grandmother. It speaks quite powerfully to me as a woman, obviously having to, um, you know, leave your children against your will potentially. The other reason it speaks powerfully to me is because in many people like myself, I'm a third generation Indo, and so that means mixed origin, Indonesian and Dutch. And for many people like myself, we have a nyai, a concubine in our lineage. So to me, and to many people like me, the Nyai represents the mother of a whole new race. So for me, I wanted to give her that dignity and restore her to that kind of rightful place in our lineage. This piece of work I made for my father. It's really what started the whole idea for this exhibition. When I first had the idea, it arose out of a real need rather than a want. This was my way of processing my grief for my father, who had died the year previously. This is actually the last costume I made in the whole series of work. Uh, one reason is because it was hard for me to make it, um, so I kind of kept putting it off. Um, another reason is that actually my, my mother and my sister were involved in making it with me. The piece itself is based on my father's judogi, which is a judo costume. My father was <laughs> big time into judo when I was a child and a teenager. And he got as far as the brown belt before he had an injury and he was prevented from getting his black belt. So I actually made him a black belt <laughs> as my little gift to him. And it was made partially with my father's hair. So uh, this is his hair, which I've incorporated into it. And he knew that I was going to use his hair. He never asked me what exactly I was going to do with it, and I wasn't sure. But when he was diagnosed with leukemia, at some point, he, due to the medication, he started losing his hair, and he decided to have it cut off, 
I asked for it and he said, yeah, sure. <laughs> and I said I would do something with it, but I, I didn't know what. And that's what it ended up being, it being part of his black belt. My mother and my sister were part of making this costume. They helped with um, the lining of it, which is made up of my father's shirts. My father had quite a drastic clothes sense and wore many very loud shirts and mismatched colours. And at some point during this process, I asked my mother if I could use some of his shirts and she went through the ones that she was happy to let me have. She sent them to me and I then spent time taking them all apart, literally unstitching them, unpicking them and tearing them up. And then I reassembled them into what became a very large abstract kind of painting almost. Um, I pinned them all in and I sent that cloth to my sister and my mother who then spent a week stitching it all together and I asked them specifically to respond with their stitching, to stitch freely and to respond to the patterns that were emerging and they did and that was a lovely part of it for me which I hadn't anticipated. It, the whole idea of a healing cloth was for me it meant something but it turned out that for them it also meant something that it gave them time to talk. My father was a motorcyclist and I used to sit in the sidecar next to him and if he saw something of interest that he wanted me to have a look at, because we couldn't communicate, he would just like hit me on the helmet and try and get my attention that way. So whenever I see a helmet, that's the association I have. Um, the other association for me is one of protection, of course, and for me this represents him having to protect himself against the trauma of his father and his mother. This body of work is called Rituals and although it's not a costume, I decided to include it into the exhibition overall because these small pieces actually became a big part for me of the whole practice of creating this body of work. Each shelf roughly relates to a costume and before I started making a costume, I would take some time to make these small objects that was partially in a way to kind of focus my attention. I had a practical purpose of trying out different techniques and, and playing with shape and colour. And actually what happened after a while of doing this, it just became a really necessary part for me to just process things. So the costumes themselves tell the stories of my ancestors. And these objects almost tell the story of what was going on inside me when I had the benefit of a bit of hindsight is that the, the process that I went through of creating all these costumes punctuated by making these small pieces was a grieving ritual. And some of these objects actually went in my father's coffin as well. So these objects became quite important in my whole process and whilst I was making them, I actually started making these when my father was ill. And that was just pure manual therapy for me to process what was going on. And as I kept on making them and kept on making them and started making them in between working on the costumes, these forms started jumping out at me and some forms were quite like seed pod like, others were almost like body parts or organs. And it just became part of this whole kind of rumination on death and dying and, and processes. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like white wool. Josiah. This is the work I made for my grandmother. Her name was Honda. And when I first started thinking about the work I wanted to make for her, I always had the idea of white very firmly in my head, including something bridal. That was partially based on the wedding photo of my grandparents, which used to hang up in our house when I was a child. I always looked at that picture and I just thought my grandparents were the most beautiful, exotic looking people. And I, I used to love looking at that picture. When I started actually working on this whole project of Hinterland and creating ancestral costumes, the white for my grandmother came very strongly to me, but that's where it stopped. And then when I was actually doing my research and asking my family members to tell, share their stories with me, I was given the Bible that my grandparents carried with them on their journey from Indonesia. 
to the Netherlands in 1950. I took it and it opened up on a Bible passage which was underlined and when I read it, it immediately to me told me that I was on the right track because it mentions white wool. I stitched all the sentences in the Bible onto my grandmother's wedding veil and it took a very long time. But ironically, I, I got a lot of comfort from doing so. It really allowed me to sit with the story and because the story was so new to me, I, I really had only just learned about it. It really hit home very hard. So having the time to sit and stitch those words really gave me time to, to let that settle. People have asked me since I've had this work on show, which work was the hardest for me to make and I have different answers. I could answer some are technically hardest uh, and some were emotionally the hardest and this one was emotionally the hardest for me to make. And the reason for that was because I was told um, a story about my grandmother that I didn't know and in fact nobody really knew that in the family because my grandmother had herself kept this story quiet all her life and had chosen only to tell one of her daughters the day before she died. So to set the scene for this um, costume, I have to just go a little bit back and talk about my great-grandfather, who was a medical director in a hospital in Malang, in Java. And during the Second World War, he used the hospital he worked in to help people escape to safety uh, from the Japanese army. And he was discovered doing this, and for that he was beheaded by the Japanese. There are various stories in the family and I don't know which one is true, but either his head was left on the doorstep or they were sent his um, bloody jacket. Uh, I'm not sure, but that's what happened to him. And then sometime after, my grandmother was arrested. I don't know much about the details of what happened after, but I do know that she was forced to become a comfort woman. Comfort women were women and girls, sometimes very young girls, who were taken by the Japanese army, sometimes under false promises of work, but more often than not, they were literally kidnapped, taken off the street, and they were forced to become sex slaves or prostitutes, as they would call them, for the Japanese army. Um, that could range from kind of rape in the back of a van to actually being put into a brothel system. And these brothel systems actually helped um, fund the Japanese war effort. I don't know exactly what situation my grandmother was taken in and how long she had to do this work for, but she was a prisoner of war for three years. I did research into wedding dresses um, from the time that my grandmother uh, was married. And this is the form that I came with. And what I really wanted to show was a wedding dress that looked like it had kind of the shape of her body still in it. So I actually wore this myself when I made it. I partially modeled it on myself. On the inside of it, in gold leaf, are lots of the quotes from the Bible that I found on the line. I don't know who underlined the quotes in the Bible. Some of them are in red, some of them are in blue, so I could guess who did who. Um, but I actually typed out all the quotes and what came through really strongly was a sense of um, somebody who feels that they have sinned and were sinned against. So there's this real kind of uh, difficult mix of emotions around sinning or being sinned against. And for me, that was really important because for somebody who's become a victim, um, totally against their will, to feel they're going through their life and to feel that they, have, they are the ones who've sinned, it uh, just really tore at my heart. But the quotes that I found in the Bible are written in gold leaf and I chose gold leaf because I was told that my grandmother had to sell her gold jewellery as a way to survive, to, to get food during her time as a prisoner. And I've also incorporated these symbols which are actually Christian symbols if they're on their side but I turned them upside down which is their original. They come from much further back, pagan symbol which actually symbolizes the seat of female power, which is the sex organ. So the dress is obviously being nailed against the wall and um, I've played with different ways of attaching it to the wall. And for this show, I asked specifically for rusty nails because it's something about the brutalism of this fragile dress being nailed against the wall that sums up the act that was committed against my grandmother perfectly. These are my grandmother's earrings um, that she used to wear when I was growing up. She always had these great big clip-on earrings that she let us try on when we were little. And for me, 
throughout all of the work and creating all of this work, this was very much about healing and healing the traumas of my ancestors. Um, I started off with this idea that in order to heal yourself, you have to heal your, your ancestors, which is a shamanic idea. And it, that was really strong and powerful that spoke to me. So the idea of incorporating personal objects, if I could, into each of these pieces was kind of imbuing the work with a sense of each individual. Having had lots of conversations around it, I kind of see connections in the work that I didn't know were there when I was making it. A lot of my choices were conscious and a lot of my choices were really unconscious. And once I saw the work out all together, which was the first time when I had it all in a gallery, I saw things that I hadn't even been aware of were there. What was really remarkable was people emotional response to what were very personal stories to me, but somehow there was a universality in all of that and people were able to share some of their own stories or start asking questions about the silences in their families and out of that came this kind of uh, to me really apparent need to to delve into the past to explore what our ancestors went through because it's part of what makes us as individuals we don't get born into the world as just a isolate a little unit, we carry the experiences of our ancestors with us and there was an urgent need for me to process it. Now I can step back a little bit and I can see the, the bigger patterns, I can see it in the context of what's happening currently, I can choose to look at specific issues such as gender and the way that women are still treated, I can look at it in terms of race and skin colour, and all that discussion that's going on around that. So I kind of feel that even though the stories are really, you know, that they happened in the past, they're still really very much current. And we can learn a lot from that. The other thing that occurred to me is that before I kind of wanted to heal myself through healing my ancestors, and now I feel it's subtly changed into wanting myself to be a good ancestor. I want to make sure that the stories aren't lost, but the trauma is released. I've transferred it into the medium of wool, and wool is beautiful in that sense is that it can hold memory, literally it can hold shapes. These traumas are sitting indefinitely in these pieces, so for me the question now is what am I going to do with the pieces in the long term?